Here's what's coming up on the program today. North Korea claims to have tested a new hypersonic missile known as Hwasong-8. A we report of the British Army being ready to help Britain out of its fuel supply shortage situation. Today we learn the Army will begin driving tankers themselves. Plus, still some amazing pictures from the moving lava on La Palma as it makes contact with the Atlantic Ocean. Well, welcome to the program today. I'm Amarachi Ubani. It's been referred to as one of the five most important new weapon systems in North Korea's five-year military plan. I'm talking about the country's newly tested hypersonic missile known as Hwasong-8. North Korea's leaders say it is a strategic meaning it most likely has nuclear capabilities. This was launched on Tuesday, another indication of Pyongyang's growing weapons technology amid strict sanctions. The launch also saw North Korea introduce missile fuel and fuel for the first time, a technology that allows missiles to be pre-fueled and then sent to the field in canisters. This means it could potentially stay launch ready for years. This is the country's third missile test this month. It already tested the trade launched ballistic missile system. Now, Russia's President Vladimir Putin is out of isolation. He's back to his presidential duties. Today, he received Turkey's President Recep Erdogan, whom he told that Turkey is shielded from a gas crisis which has gripped Europe uh, Europe uh, pipeline. Uh, speaking at the start of the talks with Erdogan in the Russian Black Sea resort of Sochi, Putin also thanked the Turkish president for his support of the pipeline, which runs to Turkey from Russia via the Black Sea. Russia commissioned Turk Stream with an annual capacity of 31.5 billion cubic meters in early 2020. Russian gas producer Gazprom says it has increased total gas supplies to Turkey by almost 160 percent from the start of the year. And those long queues remain at a fuel stations in Britain, meaning the fuel supply crisis continues. Help is on the way, though. As Business Minister Kwasi Kwarteng says, soldiers will start driving tankers to replenish empty pumps. A country has been gripped by a rush of panic buying for almost a week that has left pumps dry across major cities after oil companies warned they did not have enough tanker drivers to move petrol and diesel from refineries to filling stations. Soldiers had been mobilized and will be driving tankers within a few days, according to Quanting, adding that the situation had stabilized on Tuesday as inflow of petrol was matched by sales. I think the situation clearly is stabilizing. If we look at the inflows, the, the deliveries uh, of petrol, uh, they were matched yesterday by the sales. So that means that the situation is stabilizing. I think people are behaving quite responsibly, actually. I think people should buy petrol as normal. And clearly we've got the army on standby. We've made preventative uh, uh, measures. We've tried to alleviate the HGV driver shortage by waiving uh, visa rules. Well, it takes uh, any uh, one versed in military defense issues knows that it takes a couple of days, sometimes a few days, uh, to get troops on the ground. Um, we've decided uh, to do that, and I think in the next couple of days, uh, people will see um, some, some soldiers driving uh, the tanker fleet. Well, drivers have been quite frustrated. They have to wait at least an hour before getting any supply. It's not that difficult. There is lots of petrol stations open. They're open, but the, the queues are like an hour at least. You have to wait at least an hour. If you're lucky, you can get to the petrol stations where there is a two queues. One of the queues, it's shorter, but that's really rare. 
it's it's really bad. To the nation's politics, Labour Party leader Keir Starmer has promised to win back voters lost to Prime Minister Boris Johnson by prioritising key workers and balancing the books. A break with leftist supporters who heckled him during a uh, conference speech. After a low-key conference in the southern English seaside resort of Brighton, Starmer wanted to use his closing speech to show Labour was back in business after the party suffered its worst election defeat since 1935 in 2019. And research and development. And we will set... Level up. You can't even fill up. And, and conference, doesn't that just tell you everything you need to know about this government? Ignoring the problem, blaming someone else, then coming up with a half-baked solution. Why do we suddenly have a shortage of HGV drivers? Why is there no plan in place to those who reluctantly chose the Tories because they didn't believe that our promises were credible. It was your to the voters, to the voters, to the voters that thought we were unpatriotic or irresponsible or that we looked down on them. I say these simple but powerful words. We will never, under my leadership, go into an election with a manifesto that is not a serious plan for government. Let's turn our attention now to the latest on the lava spewing out of the Cumba Vieja volcano on La Palma in the Canary Islands, which has flattened hundreds of homes and uh, forced evacuation of thousands of people, at least 6,000. Uh, the lava has started pouring, uh, started pouring about two weeks ago. A river of lava has reached the Atlantic Ocean, releasing plumes of steam which could unleash toxic gas, which authorities say could be harmful to the eyes and skin, though they say the air is yet to be contaminated. Residents on the western coast were told to seal their doors and windows with tape and wet towels. They've, they've also not lifted the recommendation, uh, the authorities that is, but they say the measurements show the air is so far still safe to breathe. probably thinking at this time what sort of impact or effect the lava region the ocean could have on the ecosystem it is the atlantic ocean so let's bring in the man with the answers climate change experts dr john osoma he's in abuja dr osoma thank you for joining me on the program today the region the atlantic ocean could have on the ecosystem if there is to what extent of the ocean will be impacted by this uh, thank you for having me. Um, the lava situation can be very harmful to the environment in a number of ways. Uh, of course, we've already seen that uh, the lava is spewing uh, a lot of ash and, uh, and dust particles into the atmosphere. Uh, in some cases, up to 15,000 feet into the air, which has made it impossible for flights to pass through that region. Uh, then we have the issue of the quality of the air uh, within this area. It's true that we're not having a serious problem now, but if the build-up continues, uh, you're going to see a rapid uh, degradation of the air quality in this area. People can suffocate. Uh, it becomes a, a serious irritant to the eyes, to the skin. Uh, then when you look at the ocean itself, uh, lava that comes out in most cases is over a thousand degrees uh, Celsius in terms of the temperature, which is extremely hot. That's why it melts everything in, in its path. So when it touches the ocean, uh, there is, in some cases, there will be an explosion because you're mixing an extremely hot substance with cold liquid. 
that can spark explosions in that area and spew some of the, uh, some of the rocks uh, onto land. Uh, and if there are people in the vicinity, that can also hit them. Then when you get into the water ecosystem, it raises the water temperature dramatically. Uh, and things that are, are caught within that region can be fried very quickly. Uh, you will see uh, marine life washing up onto the shores. Uh, it changes the, uh, the chemical composition of the water. Uh, in some cases, it creates a toxic soup that has hydrochloric uh, acid, uh, ash, water vapor, uh, which then goes up into the air to cause acid rain uh, a few days or a few weeks later. So it's a very dangerous uh, situation, but thankfully uh, there was warning and people were evacuated. Indeed, and many homes have already been flattened. Um, many uh, the veg vegetation has been destroyed, has also been fried up, like you said. Uh, how much longer can the volcano continue spewing lava? Uh, each volcano is different. Uh, if you go back in history, in 1971, in the same Canary Island, we had a, a volcanic eruption. That one lasted for about three weeks. But when you look at the magma content, uh, and, and volcanic eruptions are about magma, if you look at the magma content that was measured for this one, it is greater than what we had in 1971. Uh, so there is a reasonable uh, guess that this one would last longer than three weeks. Uh, and we've also seen some signs of that, because just the other day, another fissure opened up uh, on the volcano, which is now spewing new material. So the magma content that came out of the mantle underneath is, is larger. Uh, so this one could last for months. We had a similar volcanic eruption in the same Canary Island in 2011. That one lasted for about five months. Uh, we've also seen some volcanic eruptions that will go for years, but not at this level of flow. So it really depends. Uh, we'll have a better sense in the next few days when measurements are taken, we'll see if there's a waning in the magma content underneath, which can be seen by satellite. Uh, and very quickly, how, how, how quickly can it cool down? Uh, the cooling, again, depends on whether it's on land or it goes into the water. Uh, within a few weeks, again, you can have the magma, will, uh, the lava will solidify. Uh, at most within a few weeks. If it goes into water, it cools very quickly within a few hours. But what happens in that case, it transfers the heat to the water yeah. uh, and it heats up the water dramatically. So that could be a problem. Uh, but I think the, the best thing for people to do is to stay away and uh, watch uh, for the flow to abate uh, and then begin to come back uh, quietly into the community. So we'll expect those changes in a few weeks. Dr. John Osoma, always a pleasure having you on The World Today. Thanks. Still ahead. Well, there it is. A fingers crossed it makes it. Uh, this white jade receptor is expected to rake in at least $13 million when it is auctioned at Sotheby's. It was the first picture uh, that you saw. Stay with us. Welcome back. A global update on the coronavirus today kicks off in Sweden, which announced it has eased most of its COVID-19 restrictions. With most adults vaccinated, Sweden has removed almost all pandemic restrictions despite rising case numbers. As of today, pandemic restrictions no longer apply to bars, restaurants and events. The country has been an outlier in aspects of its handling of the disease, shunning hard lockdowns throughout the pandemic, relying instead on recommendations regarding issues such as social distancing and hygiene. 
Russia has reported 857 new coronavirus-related deaths, the most in a single day since the pandemic began, and the second day in a row it has set that record. The government coronavirus task force also reported 22,430 new COVID-19 cases in the past 24 hours. New Zealand has reported 45 new cases of COVID-19, all in the biggest city, Auckland, taking the total number of cases in the current outbreak to 1,230. While the overall number today is obviously a lot higher, it is important to note many of these cases are linked to our existing cases and in some sense they were expected. But even more important is that we found these cases because people have come forward and been tested. This is essential for us to know what we are dealing with and high levels of testing across Auckland tell us that. So thank you to everyone again who has been or is being tested. New Zealand eliminated COVID-19 last year and remained largely virus-free until an outbreak of the highly infectious Delta variant in August led to a nationwide lockdown. Auckland is still in lockdown and new cases are being reported every day. About 43% of eligible people are now fully vaccinated. Egypt is now providing immediate COVID-19 vaccinations at youth centers across the country without prior online registration. A step aimed at encouraging vaccinations and relieving pressure on hospitals and health units and a fourth wave of infections. The health ministry says nearly 270 youth centers are now open for citizens to get the vaccines, bringing the total number of vaccination sites across the country to 1,100. The U.S. top generals uh, answering questions in Congress over the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan say they recommended keeping uh, a force of 2,500 troops in the country ahead of a full withdrawal in August. The Taliban took power in August, if we remember, after rapidly advancing through the country. General Mark Milley and General Frank McKenzie's testimonies seem to contradict President Joe Biden, who said he did not recall any such advice. General Milley said the U.S. had been taken by surprise by the speed of the Afghan government's collapse. He said it would now be harder to protect Americans from terrorist attacks from Afghanistan. Even Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is being questioned by Congress. U.S. Army veteran and geopolitical analyst Major Adebayo Adelike joins us now from Texas. Major Adelike, thank you for joining me on the program today. What's going through your mind as you listen to these top generals say that they had advised the president on retaining a 2,500 uh, a strong troop in Afghanistan uh, just before the deadline of withdrawal in August? Thank you so much, uh, Amarachi, for having me. It's nothing new. Uh, uh, you know, President Biden, if you actually followed it, uh, his thought process on Afghanistan, after the, the troop increase uh, years ago, he has always supported the narrative of pulling back out of Afghanistan. So uh, even during that when he was a vice president, I've said it on this show before, he has a uh, a track record of even advising President Obama over there not to be cornered by the generals and the Pentagon because he really wanted everyone out of the Afghanistan. So this time around, he's now the commander in chief. He wanted everybody out of the Afghanistan. And I know he listened to a lot of wide range of ideas and advices from all his uh, both military and state department, uh, uh, both military and state department advisors. Uh, but nothing has changed as uh, the generals are just military advisors to the president. Ultimately, the the president will make the decision of what goes on in Afghanistan, which he did. Uh, so not, there's nothing shocking. There is nothing surprising as there's no I know General Milley will have advised uh, about 2,500 to, to stay put. And I think for the most things from the military channel, from what I've heard so far, a lot of people prefer at least a light element over there to maintain uh, the integrity of what we have so far until majority of the pullout is done before major execution, especially when the Taliban weren't fulfilling their uh, obligation as signed by the uh, agreement that is signed. So that gives them a love. I mean, that should at least give a sign to the United States to actually hold the fort until things are done. But obviously, like I said, uh, we've seen the outcome of it, and a lot of things are going to be unfolding. Uh, if this is going to be a strategic failure, you know, time will tell.
in hindsight, do you think that it would have made a difference if, um, you know, some troops were left behind? Absolutely. You know, and I, I don't know if I shared this with you. In 2007, 2008, I had the opportunity of briefing uh, Brigadier General Milley. Uh, he was a Brigadier General. He was, he was the, you know, I was briefing him about our support operation in Kandahar there. And so he's not, uh, General Milley is very familiar with uh, what goes on in Afghanistan. He's very, he was, you know, like most of us, uh, we know a lot about the, the country. So for him to give such advice, I believe it will have generated uh, a lot of success than what we have currently. We are not saying that we're not pulling out of Afghanistan. I think the methodology applied here is what really mattered. What really mattered actually he was actually advocating that 20, i mean 2500 troops hold the fort onto major stakes uh, to actually pull out of afghanistan to avoid what we actually saw on the tv uh at, at, of course at long run most of these things will have been pulled out and jeremy Lee is, uh, is a soldier soldier is a patriot and uh you know i've, I've I, I know him he was actually as a commander for hood where i was there when it was a three-star so I commonly understand this gentleman, and you know what we have going on is just a, is a reinforcement of what goes on in our constitution, our democracy in America, that the civilian always kind of overrule what we have as a military might. So that is pretty much uh, what happened. The following orders, regardless of what happened between the president and uh, and his military generals, they always support their commander in chief. Yeah, but it, it seems like, you know, with this testimony to Congress, almost sounds like they're breaking ranks with the president. But I also wanted to point out, you know, something he said to the committee, which is that it would be harder to protect Americans from a terrorist, you know, with what has happened in Afghanistan, because the Taliban was and remains a terrorist organization and still has not broken ties with Al-Qaeda. Is America already on alert for the, you know, on the, for the possibilities of more terrorist attacks? Yes, America has always been on alert after 9-11, and I think we've never relented on this. Uh, from what General Milley's uh, assessment is, like, which is true, Taliban never actually broke contact with Al-Qaeda and will continue to, uh, you know, will continue to be that way until they renounce their association with them and, and see and on, until things continue to unfold in Afghanistan that kind of align with what the West wanted. Because as we know, the news that I'm getting personally for people that are, I know on ground or some of the allies or some of the folks that work with us is not pleasant. None of these news are palatable, what the Taliban are doing, a lot of beheadings, a lot of witch hunting going on around. And also, just to, uh, just to caveat to what you said, it does look like uh, the generals and uh, the military brass are kind of, uh, you know, uh, not on the same page with the president. But you also have to understand, as soldiers, we are sworn to the oath of the Constitution, the Constitution first, and then to the president or the order of the president. As long as the order of the president is moral, is, is ethical, and is legal, uh, they, the best they can do is to advise, and as long as you know the, the president still has the, uh, the final authority on it. So oftentimes, you know, this kind of fallout happens, but but the generals, as they do, they will tell the, they will tell it as it is. You know, yeah. they advise the president, and uh, the outcome is also you know what the president decided to be. So, yeah. unfortunately, we are going to be where we are right now until things unfold in Afghanistan. That is something that is controllable, as we can yeah. see right now, uh, is still unstable. Major Delicate, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your analysis on this and uh, your insight uh, to what's going on in Afghanistan. Thank you so much, Amarachi. And as we end the program, we'll be seeing it in a minute. A white jade receptor presented today in Hong Kong is tipped to fetch up to $13 million when it heads to auction on October 13. There it is. Chairman of Sotheby Asia told a media preview event the rare scepter belonged to Emperor Qianlong of the Qing Dynasty 250 years ago. And it's inscribed with a poem the emperor composed to sing its praises, Nicholas Cho. Cho, who is the chairman of Sotheby Asia, said it is considered to be the finest scepter ever made for a Chinese emperor partly for its rare dragon carving and the poem inscription. Of $13 million is a lot. I wish we had more time to really see it. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi.